Hello and welcome back to my Humankind tier list maker. And uh, before we go into the early modern cultures, I just want to show off uh, that I went with the Khmer. As I said in the previous uh, era video, the Khmer are the strongest Civ in that era by a, a long, long margin. And we can see things like 73 industry on this beret, 69 on this beret, 63, 63... 63 the beret is fantastic and yeah you're not going to be finding a better uh, um, emblematic quarter uh, in that era uh, but we have reached all of our era stars and we're time to go to the next era so we'll see what we get first of all we have the dutch and the dutch are pretty good they're pretty good uh, they are a merchant and in this era you're probably going to be having uh, diplomatic overtures with many empires so, you know, having the Dutch be able to um, have the, the mediation ability where everyone can trade from you is very nice. Uh, you get plus one money per population on all cities, which can be very nice as well. If you've got a large population, of course, it's even better. Um, it's a nice money sieve uh, for that. Uh, you have the VOC warehouse, which if you're landlocked, completely useless. Don't even bother buying it. But if you are on the water... And you have a bunch of harbors, especially if you can have multiple harbors next to each other or multiple, um, you know, harbor and a Noust and a Cothon and a Haven all together. Um, building a VOC warehouse next to all of them, you get plus 20 money per adjacent harbor. Um, you can really boost this depending on, you know, your location, depending on uh, the terrain around you. This can be very, very nice. Um, also gives you plus two money per trader and an extra trader slot. Um, very nice little bonus, very nice little um, emblematic district. Uh, can be quite situational though, because um, sure, once you've built all your VOC warehouses on the coast, the problem is um, you can't build next to harbors naturally, right? They have to be attached to your city, you can't attach them to your harbor. So if you've got your city inland and then it's attached to a, um, a or, or the outpost, I guess is relatively inland and the uh the harbors are always on the coastline of course uh being able to get this voc warehouse over there can be a little bit difficult uh this is where the hamlet really comes into effect you uh build hamlets nearby your coastline then you're able to build the voc warehouse but it's just it's a little awkward sometimes and if it's not next to the ocean the voc warehouse is really terrible giving just plus one money it gives extra trader slot and trader money but it's just really bad if you're not able to put it next to a harbor. So, a little bit situational. Um, if you're able to build it, get the most out of it, then it can be very valuable. But otherwise, it's valueless. Uh, the Floyd is their naval unit. It can go into deep water without having an issue. And it has increased movement speed when starting its turn in allied territory. Uh, so, you can get that little bit of a head start uh, on naval exploration. But... Yeah, that, that affects you for one turn, and you're not really having too much of a bonus after that way. Um, it's also naval transport, so this is, if you're the Dutch, this is the probably the first time that you're going to be able to get units to go uh, into the New World. Um, but it also requires the three-masted ship technology, um, so if you can get that early, then great. If not, then it's, 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 a, it's a unit. It's a unit. It's not exactly the most powerful combat ship um, in this era. It's just, it's a unit. Uh, the Dutch, I would say, I would probably put them in a B tier right now. Uh, they'll probably honestly move up as we look at some of the er, uh, other um, cultures, because I do honestly think the early modern is the weakest for strong cultures. Um, everything is kind of just average. So they will probably move up in relation to others. Uh, but at the moment, I think B is probably where it's at. Moving on, next up, we have the Hordena Sawney. Um, they are a food sieve. They get plus one food on exploitations. Um, so any luxury resources, any uh, strategic resources, you get plus one food on them as well. It's okay. It's all right. Um, you're probably not going to be seeing more than about 30 to 40 food uh, from this at, at the absolute maximum. So it can be a little bit... It doesn't scale phenomenally well, uh, but it's okay. Obviously, as a food sieve, gaining stability when gaining population, which is always nice. 
Um, their M minus quarter is the three sisters plantation. Plus five food per number of attached territories. Really, really good. Um, you're going to have a lot of attached territories at this point in the game. So getting extra food there is always nice. Um, things like plus 40 food is quite reasonable and easy to see at this uh, level um, per Three Sisters Plantation, which you can put in every single region. Um, so it really supports the big city kind of gameplay. Uh, plus three food per adjacent market, uh, farmer's quarter as well. Um, another farmer slot on the city, and it counts as a farmer's quarter. So, you know, it's all about the food. It's all, there's nothing else in here but food. Uh, and then you have our first gunpowder infantry that we've seen in the game so far, um, which is the... Here we go. Rotis Kenrakete. Nailed it. Uh, it's a gunner unit. Cannot be seen um, except by adjacent units, so you can... Have this in your back line on a hill, shooting over the heads of your friends, um, and it will they will not be able to return fire. Um, you can hide this in a forest, uh, shooting in, um, and unless they get adjacent to you, they will not be able to see it. Um, it's a really good unit. Um, 41 strength isn't the highest we'll see for gunpowder units, but... Um, so, that is ahead of Dinosaurny. And I think we're going to pop these guys maybe in... Uh, it's it's tempting to put it in A tier. It's also tempting to put it in B tier. And really, we're going to have to adjust our, um, our, our windows if we do that. Um, I think... I think I'm going to put it in B tier. Um, it's a good unit. It's not the most amazing unit. It's not the most amazing Civ. But it's decent, and I think, yeah, I'm pretty happy with putting it there. So, moving on, we have the Joseon, our first science sieve of this era. And I think it's actually the only science sieve of this era. Uh, yes, it is. The only science sieve of this era. So, let's have a look at what you get with the Joseon. They are sciences sieve, so you'll be able to go one era in the future to research. You also have uh, the ability to turn all your industry and money into research so you can really pump it out if this is what you're wanting and you get plus three science on tiles producing science um this includes research quarters this includes your emblematic district this includes things like horses um and all of the little curious things like um i, I want to call them spawning pools that's not it like geysers and such um all of the uh, research that you'll find in the ocean as well plus three science on all of those can situationally be very very powerful you also have the seal one to give you a little bit of influence a bit of science plus the science for adjacent research quarter um it's not the most amazing science building in the game but it is very very good um and as you're the only science sieve of this era you can you can boost yourself into the next one uh you can get research from the next era so you know, dragging units that you shouldn't have access to into the earlier era can be something you do. Um, maybe unlock coal a little early, unlock oil a little early. All these kinds of things are possible. Um, so yeah, CO1 is... it's decent. It's not terrible. Uh, and finally, you have the Geobuxon, the, uh, the turtle ship, uh, which is very good. It can also ram enemy ships, uh, increased movement speed in battle, and has a bonus combat strength against adjacent units adjacent targets um so you don't want to be fighting this from range um or fighting with this from range i should say you want to be you know getting up close and personal to other uh ships 45 strength is very good for a naval combat ship in this era um costs two copper and two saltpeter uh which is your gunpowder um resource uh it's just it's it's okay it's okay um this is the era where naval combat starts to ramp up, so getting a decent combat ship in this era can be very valuable. Um, I think with the Josong, I'm going to put them in C tier. I don't think they're as good as the Hodinasoni, uh, but they're okay. As the only science sieve, they're really good for that, but there's nothing in the next era that is like super critical. So yeah, I'm fairly happy with a C tier for them. I could see them in B as well. Um, all right, moving on. We have next got the Ming, which are an aesthetic uh, civilization, uh, which means you've got the cultural bits 
Uh, spend a bunch of influence, get a bunch of money. Um, we've gone over it before. We have the Grand Secretariat, a negative 25% cost of enacting and cancelling civics, and plus one influence on territories. Um, civics, you've got, at this early modern era period, you've probably got a bunch of spare civics that you have not taken yet. Um, so getting the Grand Secretariat is probably pretty valuable. You've probably finished your expansion, at least on this continent, and you're looking at, um, you know, you've got a lot of civics that you've been putting off because, you know, your your influence is more valuable spent on expansion rather than civics, and now you're looking at, you know, swapping that around. Um, main can be really good for that. They have the Grand Tea House giving a extra influence per district, um, which is very good considering it's counting all of the districts in the city, um, you can have a heck of a lot of influence as the Ming from those Grand Tea Houses. You get plus 10 stability from it, and plus 2 influence per adjacent district as well, so, you know, you get in probably more than any other Civ, this is the one that's going to give you the biggest influence boost. Um, if you've taken uh, the previous era one that gives influence, I think it's called, the, yeah, the Franks, uh, which give you plus 10% influence, um, then the Ming, you're going to be looking very, very handy. You also have the Rocket Cart, requiring three saltpeter. It is a heavy weapon. It can only move or attack, um, and it can suppress the enemy. Um, the target unit cannot move next turn as reduced combat strength. Uh, being able to suppress enemy infantry while you're just shooting at them um, it's fantastic. If you're fighting, you know, five rocket carts versus five, uh, say, cavalry units, you can stunlock them and just kill them over periodic turns of just shooting them. Um, they can't move, so you just keep shooting at them, and they can't do anything. Their turn just ends. The rocket cart is really, really good for that. Um, yeah, um, good for influence, probably the best influence-based civ in the game. Um, the rocket car is great as well. I think for the Ming, we're going to pop them in a tier. Next up, we have the Moogles. Uh, the Moogles are a builder sieve that automatically puts you higher because builder sieves are phenomenal and great and you can't really go wrong with them. Um, we have Imperial Magnificence, plus 2% industry per number of territories in your sphere of influence on the capital. So on your capital, you're going to get a lot of extra influence. Uh, oh, look, sorry, yeah, a lot of extra industry if you have been uh, very strong in the early game and maybe uh, conquering an entire continent, or if you've gone with an influence sieve in the early game and your influence, your culture is being spread to other territories across the across the world, maybe through trade or whatever. Getting an extra well, I mean, you could easily, easily see yourself with plus 30, plus 40 percent industry on your capital, um, purely because of Imperial Magnificence. It can't be understated, this is a really, really good, um, good bonus to have. Um, say you've gone Olmex in the early game and your, your influence is, like, spread from the very start of the game, uh, going multiple influences and then going into Mughals, like I say, you could see massive gains from Imperial Magnificence, so definitely recommend uh, looking at this one. We have the Jamar Masjid, which gives industry per workers, gives extra influence, plus industry again, and then plus industry per adjacent makers quarters. It's just another really good industry building. It's not on the level of the Barre, but it is very good nonetheless. Um, seeing things like plus 50, plus 60 from the Jamar Masjid is not unheard of. Um, if you've got a lot of workers, um, it just boosts it even further. It is just really, really good. If you've gone um, with a, a lot of industry in the early game, and then you've got the Jamal Masjid, you've got, say, 20 workers um, in your um, in your city, uh, getting plus three from each of them. Yeah, it's, it's really, really, really good. Um, and this is per Jamal Masjid as well. Build five of these in five different regions, you're getting a ton of value here. And finally we have the Gajnal, which is an it's an elephant with a cannon on it. What more do you want? This is just cool. Before with the Khmer, we had an elephant with a, um, a ballista. 
Before that, we had the Marians with an elephant with a, a bow. The Carthaginians had just an elephant with a spear or whatever. And now we've got elephants with cannons. You cannot go wrong with an elephant with a cannon on it. It requires two copper and two saltpeter. It can move and fire. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. Um, you have to research siege cannons. Um, but... Yeah, the Gajnal is just... It's just delightful. Uh, putting everything together, the Mughals, are quite easily S tier. Um, this Magnificence is magnificent. Um, the Jamama Street is a great building. The Gajnal is a great unit. Everything about this screams S tier, and I'm pretty happy to put them there. Moving on, we have the Ottomans, who, despite having a cannon in their image, don't actually get a cannon unit. It is what it is. Uh, they're an expansionist. All the problems with expansionists are still evident here. Um, expansionist stars are very difficult to attain, especially in the early modern period. Uh, and probably less so in the early modern than the previous eras, actually, because you'll be able to expand in the new world. Um, but you have to actually get to the new world. Um, but expansionist is still always going to be bad. I don't think I need to keep harping on about it. Uh, they get negative 50% on heavy weapon industry cost, which would be great if their Empire unit was heavy weapons, but they're not. It is what it is. Plus three combat strength on heavy weapons. These are things like bombards. Um, these are things like cannons. Uh, these are things like the, um, the, the rocket artillery that we just saw uh, the Ming have. Um, you tend to use more of them as the game goes on after the early modern. Uh, the Bombard, I think, is like the first one you use, but like tanks also count, so plus three combat strength on your tank and 50% cheaper tanks later on in the game. You know, this this is something that, um, in the early modern, it's alright. In the later eras, in the industrial and in the contemporary era, this scales so nicely, so, so nicely. Especially if you've already got negative 50% um, because of taking, say, Hittites in the early game and then taking the other sieve, which I've forgotten which gives it. Uh, but there's another one that gives the, the, the bonus to um, a unit cost. And then you take the Ottomans. Um, all of your heavy weapons are now free. I think they still cost, like, I don't think you can click and build them instantly. Like, they still take a turn. But they're basically free, um, and yeah, you can you can really pump out the the heavy armor uh, very easily as the Ottomans. Um, their uh, emblematic quarter is the Sultan Kamii, 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 whatever. Uh, faith influence, uh, faith per adjacent district. It's very meh. Um, it's not what you pick the Ottomans for. It's not something I really rate too highly. Uh, but then we also have the Janissaries. Uh, they're a gunner unit, um, so they require one saltpeter, they also require one iron, and they're siege masters, so they get bonus combat strength when participating in an assault or a sortie, so on the offense and defense. Um, early modern, yeah, you're probably going to come across sieges, this will be the era where you're um, attacking other countries, Janissaries, very good on that front, also 44 combat strength, can't be sniffed at. Um, so where would I put the Ottomans? They're a difficult one because this is garbage, this is great, this is garbage, this is alright. I think all together, I think I'd also put them in B. I think I'd also put them in B. Um, they're not... Again, situational. If you're, if you're going, if you're in a multiplayer, you're going to be using more heavy weapons than you're in single player. I think. And in that case, I would put them in A. Because being able to get free, uh, basically free units, they still cost pops, of course, but being able to get that scales so nicely. Um, and you're more likely to come under siege and more likely to siege uh, in a multiplayer game. So in a multiplayer, I'd say put, I'd maybe put them in a low A, but... I think for now, put them in put them in in a mid B is is probably where they belong. Moving on, we have the Poles. Of course, then the Winged Hussars arrived. Uh, they are a militarist, so they can go to war without issue. Gone over that before. 
They have deadly ramparts, um, so plus 10 uh, district fortification on districts, um, can be quite nice, and plus 2 stability on districts, similar to the Zhou in the early game. So if you've taken the Poles and the Zhou, um, then you're really not going to have too many issues with uh, stability. This means that every two and a half districts you'll have a free district um which you know it's if you've been struggling for stability then you turn the early modern and you take the poles your stability issues suddenly go away for a while uh it's very very nice on that front uh their empire quarter is the barbican it's a defensive fortification building gives you stability gives uh combat strength for units in or adjacent to the district and it protects neighboring tiles from being ransacked um, it's decent, uh, it's obviously it's a very defensive building, so you're not going to be getting much use out of it if you're on the offense, which single player, you're probably on the offense. Multiplayer, I could see this being uh, useful if you are being hurt. Um, but yeah, the Barbican, it's a decent building, it's not bad at all. Uh, and then finally you have the Winged Hussars, which um, are very, very good. Um, they have 46 strength, they require 2 horses and 2 iron, and the best thing about them is that when they charge the enemy, they cannot retaliate. So, on the offense, they act basically like archers, where they can do damage and take none in return. Um, of course, when they get attacked in the next turn, it's going to be tough, but if you're facing an enemy that has a lot of spearmen and you have winged hussars, you can initially do so much damage to them without taking any in return, which is just really, really good. It's really, really good. Ring of Sars are great. Where would I put the poles? Oh man, again, I'm I'm considering low B to high C. Um, I think we're going to go with a C on the poles. Uh, probably blow Joson as well, to be honest. Um, they're okay. Um, stability is nice, which probably puts them above uh, Joson. Um, Barbican is not something you're going to find too much use out of. Uh, the Winged Hussars are good, um, but their cavalry, and cavalry is kind of dropping off at this point until you get Dragoons. And I mean, if you've got Dragoons, you're not having Winged Hussars, so they kind of drop off further there again. It's uh, it's an awkward one. Um, high C, I think, is, is probably where the poles belong. Next up, we have the Spanish, which I initially didn't rate very highly because they're expansionist. And expansionists are almost always garbage because expansionist is garbage. However, we have Honor and Glory. Plus three combat strength on units starting their turn in a non-allied territory. When you're on the offense, the Spanish are great. And when you're on the offense in the later industrial or um, contemporary era, you still have this bonus. This scales really, really well. Um, in the late game, this is probably the time when you're looking at conquering enemies to take them out and, and win the game, and getting that plus three combat strength if you're starting in non-allied territory can be very, very good. Empermanic Quarter kind of lets them down. Um, faith at this point I don't think is too um, important. Um, if your faith is not already completely dominant, it's probably dead. And you, it's very difficult to bring a faith back from the brink. Um, so, yeah, plus one faith per population. Yay, it's great. But I just don't see this as something I would focus on or something I'd really value that much. The Conquistadors, however, are very, very good. They generate extra money from winning battles and ransacking. So if you're having battles, if you're going over and conquering as, you know, your honor and glory demands you do, uh, you're going to be getting a lot of money from these guys because of El Dorado, which I understand you can't actually see on this um, on my video, but just believe me, underneath Gunner it says El Dorado generates additional money from winning battles and ransacking. Uh, it's not a it's not something that you can uh, sniff at. It's great. It's a really good little bonus, and um, Conquistadors are very very good for that reason, very much so. Uh, Conquistadors I rate very highly. Um, so Spanish, oh, that's another difficult one because this is crap. This is great. This is crap. This is great. Where does that put you? Probably in B. Again, just B is getting really filled up here. There's just there's a lot of very average um, sieves in in this era. That's the four. So yeah, uh, I'm I'm pretty, yeah I'm really. 
I'm happy enough with putting them in B. Um, I said at the start, that's that's what we're looking at, uh, seeing a lot of um, pretty average in the early modern. Nothing really standing out other than the Mughals so far, and then the Ming. Uh, but anyway, we're looking at the Ito Japanese now. Uh, they are an aesthetic uh, civilization, so, you know, get money when you're spending influence on your cultural blitz. Uh, they get influence per population on city or outpost. Just a really good bonus to your influence. Uh, not quite as much as the Ming, I would say, but pretty good. Um, they have the Terra, which is plus influence, plus faith, plus five influence per adjacent mountain. Uh, so if you haven't already spammed all your research quarters next to mountains, then, you know, you'll probably find some bonuses from the Terra. And they have the Nan, uh, sorry, Naginata Samurai, which is a spear unit, anti-cavalry. Uh, just like the Varangian Guard, they're unable to retreat, uh, but being anti-cavalry, they're pretty good. Also, 46 strength is very high for this era. Uh, you're going to have some pretty good luck with the Naginata Samurai, um, depending on if your enemy has taken somebody like the Mughals and they've got uh, elephants, or say they've taken uh, the Poles with winged hussars, these anti-cavalry samurai are pretty good. Um, overall, though, I don't rate the Japanese mm, very highly. I put them in above the Poles, but probably beneath, beneath the Spanish. All right, next up, finally, we have the Venetians. This is a money-making civilization, so uh, being able to instantly build a, um, a strategic resource. Um, even in your allies, to be honest, that's not something I'd mentioned before, but if uh, your ally has a, um, a, a source of gold that they just haven't taken yet, you can go over and you can click that, and both you and your ally gain money from that. I've seen, you know, 500 gold per side be something that we've seen um, quite frequently. You can also click on uh, strategic resources that have already been built and then get money that way as well. So, you know, it's something I hadn't mentioned with the merchant before, but that's something else that they can do. And also the mediation, which is just great. Um, we have Silver Tongues, plus money per number of trade routes on City Outpost, plus money uh, per naval trade route on City Outpost. So you're going to get a lot of money as the Venetians from Silver Tongues. Um, this is the era where you're going to be training quite a lot. So having this it really just boosts you further. Um, their Ebon Planet Quarter, though, I don't rate very highly at all. The Boche de Artisti, whatever, Bottega de Artisti. Gives you influence, gives you a tiny bit of money, gives you influence per adjacent market quarter. You probably don't have too many market quarters because they're just not that great. So generally what you're going to find is you've got an emblematic quarter that you can place down that gives you plus four influence and plus one money. And that's it. And I just do not rate that building whatsoever. I don't think it's worth anything at all. I don't build them. Uh, I've taken the Venetians before. Um, you gain money from Silver Tongues, but this is such a letdown, it's just not worth it. Uh, we have the Galeas, which cost two copper and two saltpeter. They're uh, very good in inner seas, so if they're in coastal waters, the light-colored water, uh, they get a much higher combat strength. Um, but if they're in deep water, obviously they're, they're only at the 39. So they can punch above their weight if they're fighting in, uh, in inland seas, so that's quite nice. Um, yeah, uh, Venetians, uh, D, D. This, this is just so bad that it brings everything else down. Um, I'd say it's definitely worse than Joson. Um, it belongs in D, and I'm, I'm happy to put it there. And also, don't know why I zoomed out, uh, scrolled up there, but, um, yeah, uh, D tier Venetians, um, there's not really much of anything to say about that. It, that's where they belong. That's where they belong. And that's it for the early modern era. Uh, I would say there's a lot. It, it's probably the weakest era for civilizations, right? Um, if you're playing a multiplayer and somebody's taking the Mughals and somebody's taking the Ming, you're really not going to have too many great options to pick from, right? You know, the Dutch is is very situational. Hodenosaunee is is okay. It's it's decent. It's pretty good, um, but. Yeah, there's just there's just not much there that I'm like really happy with. But yeah, uh, I definitely obviously go with the Mughals uh, as my top pick. Um, 
Ming as well, and then and then Dutch. And I'm, I'd be relatively happy with that tier list. Uh, so let me know what you think. Uh, have I got any of these in the wrong place? If so, let me know in the comment section below. I um, hope these uh, little um, tier list guides are helping you in choosing your cultures going through the eras. And until next time, thank you very much for watching, and bye-bye.